Gospel of Luke, 16th chapter, beginning the very first verse. <clears throat> 16, verse 1. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly. Make it 450. Then he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushel of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill, make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than our people of light. I tell you, use your worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, maybe we've become um, too accustomed to it, but it seems like there's a lot of corporate cor corporate corruption going on these days, at least in recent history. I think thinking back to Enron, Bernie Mac, most recently, Wells Fargo, Facebook, uh, all these corporations making um, unethical decisions and, and questionable actions. And, and you know, we, we know these are all driven by individuals. And, and you wonder what drives that kind of decision, what, what drives that kind of, of action, you know. And it, it's easy to think they're just bad people. Yeah. But um, a former prosecutor said, when I first began prosecuting corruption, I really expected to walk in the rooms and find the, the, the worst people, the vilest people. But I, I, I was shocked to find ordinary good people. People I could well have coffee with that morning. But there's still good people who make terrible choices. A recent survey said 41% of workers reported seeing unethical conduct in the past 12 months of their employment. And 10% said they felt organizational pressure to compromise ethical standards in, in, in financial dealings. 24% of financial executives in America and England believe that it is necessary to engage in unethical or illegal conduct just to be successful in today's business world. 24% of executives. Maybe we've got unrealistic performance targets and that results in excessive pressure to succeed, just kind of, you know, uh, get ahead at any cost type deal. But, you know, this, this kind of mentality, this, this, this pursuit of success and this, this uh, pursuit of wealth calls us to walk over people and to use people and to take advantage, leverage position. Greenspan said that corruption, embezzlement, fraud, these are all characteristics that exist everywhere. It's regrettably the way human nature functions, whether we like it or not. Just the way we are, or the way they are. So I guess it's not surprising to find out people make bad, um, even intentional, illegal choices. It's not surprising that sometimes in, in the cutthroat environment of, of our modern business world, it's, it's not only allowed, but sometimes even expected and rewarded. I could tell stories of, of, of the same on the railroad. And it's not surprising that Jesus addresses it in, in this parable. And this parable is bad from the start. Because we're talking about a money manager. You know, we're talking about accountants. Anytime Jesus is talking about money, it's usually bad. And this manager wasn't very good. The parable tells us he was caught wasting 
the master's money. Now, now I don't know what it, what it means, wasting, I, but I think of, of Cratchit in, in, uh, in uh, the Christmas Carol, you know, that he's wanting to put that one little coal on, on the fire to stay warm. You know, it, it, is it just being, you know, not being frugal? We don't really know what the wasting was, but we do know that it's described the same term used for the prodigal squandering of the resources. So, so it was it wasn't just you know an additional lump of coal here. There, it was it was wasteful and it was intentional. It was a misappropriation of funds, probably more than likely for personal gain, because we know how people are. And so this guy finally gets called, and, and the boss is outraged. He goes, clean out your desk, get the books in order, and get off the property. This is your two weeks' notice. Seize your pink slip. And he's, he's at a loss. Because when this gets out, his reputation is going to be ruined. You know, no one's going to hire him in the financial world again. He can't do menial labor. He's been sitting at the desk too long. He's got way too much ego to go out. Hey, what's he going to do? Well, you know, the boss didn't say get the books in order, right? So he calls all the debtors, and he negotiates. Well, for being such a loyal customer, I want to offer you some sweeping discounts because we're having this enormous going out of employment event, and I can save you significant, right? Substantial savings for these clients. But we know at a cost of, of loss for the master, this guy is fully committed, right? It reduces some of the debts by half. Now, if you're going to burn bridges, don't just char them, right? Burn them down to the ground. And he makes sure he does that. What's he got to lose? And when it's all said and done and the, the dust settles on these books, the master situation is even worse than two weeks ago when he caught this guy. And the master commends him. Shame I had fired him. He sure cost me a lot of money, but he sure was slick. He knew what he was doing. It's no wonder that Fred Craddock said this is one of the strangest of all of Jesus' parables. Again, it's not surprising that Jesus addresses human corruption. You know, that's kind of his mission. Now, I think that's kind of what, well, one of his focus points while he was here. So it's not surprising he addresses human corruption. What is surprising is that Jesus lifts it up as an example. And this is, this is the plot twist. This is that slippery slope. Jesus commends the action. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves with worldly wealth that can welcome you into eternal home. Jesus not only commends this guy, but he lifts it up as an example. And we don't have to, this is one of those parables we don't have to go to great lengths to understand, do we? We know human corruption. It's not like the shepherds, you know, we were talking about the, the shepherds and the lost sheep last night, or last week, we were talking about, you know, how the difference of, of shepherding was 2,000 years ago compared to today. You know, stealing, stealing, we can, we can wrap, wrap our brain around that pretty easily. Crookedness was the same back then as it is now. And this attitude isn't surprising us. You know, that's how you get by in this world. We know that's how you do it. And we know how to play the system. Use what you can to get what you can. We know it. We've seen it. Maybe we've even done it. But then we understand Jesus is talking about the kingdom here. And it's so unsettling, many people have tried to justify the statement. They say, oh, well, when, when the manager called these people, he was just cutting out his commission. Or, or he was just eliminating the, the compounded interest, getting right back down to the principal. It doesn't say that. Jesus said he wasted the master's money, property. Jesus called it dishonest. He doesn't say, well, he would have did it at some personal sacrifice, but dishonesty. And I think Jesus knows the difference of those two as well. Some of your Bibles will hit this as the shrewd 
man, it reminds me of this. This one said he acted shrewdly. The shrewd manager. And we have to understand, Jesus is not commending dishonesty. He's commending truth. The use of current resources to gain future rewards. Using what is available in the present to make a better future. This man was, again, at a loss. He was faced with limited possibilities, limited opportunities. And so he used what he could with what he had to expand what he could get. And while the focus is upon the money, it, it, it's more than about money. He's saying we can use physical resources for eternal rewards. And, and, and we understand that they're all of Asher's resources. Everything we've been given is, is actually a gift that we're stewards over from God. None of them will last forever, so use them wisely. So it's this, it's this use it or lose it with motivation. Use worldly assets to gain kingdom friends. And we know that there's on the physical side, there's things we can do, right? Because Jesus told us. If we clothe the naked and feed the hungry and, and, and visit the lonely, then those are physical things we can do to get, you know, eternal securement. And so he's telling us to do that because no matter how much you gain in this life, one day it's going to be useless. And, and so that's the primary motivation of the plot. An impending loss of resources resulting in an insecure future. How do you secure that future? And while there are these physical things that we're talking about, there's more to it than that when I look at this parable. While it is a story told under the premise of finances, it's also a message about attitude and commitment and devotion. And when I read this, I hear Jesus saying, you know, these worldly people, they put a lot of thought and effort and devotion into succeeding in their physical existence than the righteous do in succeeding in their eternal one. They will go to greater lengths. They will take greater risks. They will spend more time. They will devote more resources. They will be more creative for a temporal reward than we are for a heavenly one. I mean, we, we, we know you do what you do, or you do what you got to do to get ahead in this world. We know that. But we do do we apply the same to get into that eternal life? <clears throat> and if not, why? If you're going to do it to please an earthly master, why not for your heavenly one? I guess it's about what we value most. And I guess it's about what we consider true success. And I guess it depends on which future we're focusing on. Every day of our life. But if what is most important to us is living for God, and if our ultimate goal is to spend eternity in God's presence, shouldn't we be putting a little more effort into it? Shouldn't we be a little bit more shrewd in our dealings with our spiritual side? Shouldn't we be a little bit more sacrificial? And doing our job. Because outside of God, our future is threatened. But we've got the master's resources. We've got the books right here before us. He's given us the resources and he's offered us the opportunity to secure an eternal future. How much effort are we putting into it? We put as much effort in, in getting that future as, as we do in, in you know, building up our 401k or our health care plan. The children of this age are more shrewd than the children of the law. So Jesus gives us an example, a challenge, to show where our priorities lie. And ask us what efforts we're going to go to to secure it. Are we giving our master our all? Are we shrewd in our position? If not, we serve the day. Let's turn.
Turn to our hymn book, our hymn of patience. 609, I'm going to stand and sing, Take My Life. Here's verses 1, 4, and 6 of Take My Life. 609. In closing, this opportunity to consider just where you're at, where your priorities are, what is most important to you. Not to you, God, you're all. Make a decision to take this. Share it this morning. Take my life, 1, 4, and 6.